Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peak Human Project. Today my guest is Dr. Bill Campbell, who is a professor at the University of South Florida, where he studies nutritional strategies for physique enhancement and physique athletes. Dr. Campbell was actually my thesis and research advisor when I was in my master's program at the University of South Florida. And he's been really influential in my journey and molding me into the coach that I am today. Dr. Campbell has several excellent books and a wonderful Instagram page where he shares a lot of his knowledge in easy to understand infographics and questions. So be sure to check him out on there. In this episode, we talk about his nutritional strategies that he's been focusing on in his research and a little bit more about how nutrition plays a role in just feeling better, performing better and otherwise. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, Dr. Bill Campbell. All right. Hey, Dr. Campbell. Uh, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, you know, uh, obviously we know each other pretty well. I was a student of yours at USF and the exercise science program. Um, you know, I got to know you through Lane Norton, who basically recommended that I go to your program down at USF. I reached out. I remember the day that pretty vividly the day that I, that I got a phone call from you, um, you know, asking me whether I wanted to be in the program and things like that was like a, a really big deal for me at the time. I was so happy to get that phone call. And one thing that I've always loved about you is just how, you know, down to earth you are, even, you know, within science, I think you're a big deal. I think you have a lot of great research out there. I think now you're starting to get recognized. I see your social media following growing. And, um, but, but you've never, you never come across as somebody who, uh, you know, a lot of PhDs, sometimes they get sort of a big head <laughs> to, to put it, to put it mildly, I guess, but you've always just been such a down to earth guy, somebody that I feel like I could talk to on a, on a, you know, a real basis and not feel intimidated. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's how I got to know you, and, and, and obviously I went through the program, and we did a, a study together, and I know now, um, when I was there, you were trying to transition more towards physique science, nutrition science, things like that, as opposed to what we were doing at the time, which was a little bit more lifting focused, especially with my study. How yeah. have things gone with that since over the last couple of years, now that I've been gone? What kind of research have you gotten into? Have you been able to kind of transition away from what we were doing before? Yeah. So just a, a little perspective on that at the, at the time. And, and yes, you were a student, but you weren't just any student. You were like the student that I, you were my blue chip recruit that year. I was like, we got to get this guy here. I think if I remember correctly, 4.0 from Arizona State. You had research experience. Yeah. Just looked like on paper, just tons of knowledge and experiences. So I knew then, as I know now, when students like you show an interest, you've, you've got to, you got to recruit them. You, you, I've got to, and, and I hope I made it abundantly clear to you then, like, please come here. We have a role for you. So at that time, my top students were all interested in powerlifting. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, so we, we spent probably a th about a three to four year period, probably right before you came and probably about a year or two after you left. Our, my lab was very powerlifting focused. And I like powerlifting, but my passion is more bodybuilding and let's say fat loss, what, what I term physique enhancement. Mm -hmm. So I started to transition a little bit more towards that. And now it's for whatever reason, the students that, that are coming here are more interested in that. So I would say around the time you were here, I was leveraging the strengths of my students and I'm still doing that, but, the, but my research agenda has changed where we're not doing, I would say we haven't done a powerlifting study probably in the last three years, wow. two, three years. Yeah. And my lab is very female focused now as well. Most of our studies um, only recruit female subjects. I have a much larger research team comprised of females and we're doing more fat loss, dieting, weight loss. Now, when I say that, 
there's always a resistance training component to what we do. So people are still lifting in the physique lab, sure. uh, which you got to come visit when you're here. The, the labs Absolutely. changed even more than when you were here last. So can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm excited. Yeah. So I, and, and you've done a bodybuilding show way back in the day, correct? Yes. Yeah. Oh, actually, now that you mentioned, it, I think it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah. Boy, I bet the sport's changed a lot in those 20 years, especially with the natural side of things being kind of coming to prominence. But, yeah. you know, I, know, I, think, it, I think it's interesting that um, you, you focus more on um, females nowadays. And I think that, and I think we had this conversation back when I was at USF, that, that females are a lot, they're kind of underrepresented with the research. Everything's done mostly on males. Um, for one reason or another, have you found it difficult, more difficult, less difficult to recruit female physique or female participants for your studies? Or is it, has it been pretty smooth sailing for you? No, it's, it's not any, I don't think it's been any harder or more. It hasn't been easier or more difficult. Um, one, I can definitely sense the appreciation more so. Okay. Um, because like, as you said, I, I would say 90% of the published literature on resistance training is in males. Yeah. Um, and I, I, ha, I, I guess my motivation is twofold. One, it's females at that age range of 18 to 24, they're much more compliant. They're willing to let researchers implement variables into their diet and training that males aren't as eager to do, especially with the training. Mm -hmm. males at that age aren't as mature and just getting them to, to do diet records or tracking their macros. They don't, they don't execute it on it as well as females. Yeah. Um, another consideration is when you were here, I was, you know, one of the weakest guys in the lab as an old guy. So it's hard to get to garner respect from That's subjects, true. maybe even from, from some of my staff, like, well, why are you telling us how to do the study when, you're not even squatting 400 pounds. Right. Females, I'll just say that's the ego part of it. I don't have any of that with females. So there, there's a, you know, a little more respect. So for all of those reasons, one, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm improving the situation of the female representation. And two, I, I think it just, I, I can be a better researcher because I'm getting better feedback. I'm getting better buy-in from them as participants in the studies. Yeah, I can attest to that uh, in two ways. Uh, when I was doing my study there, um, obviously it was in males, and it is—it was. I mean, it was easy to get people in the door. It was—it was hard to keep them there because <laughs> yeah. they wanted to do their own thing all the time. They—they they wanted to do extra stuff outside of what you know my my training program was in the study. Um, the compliance was was hard. I think that was the hardest part of the study. I think, and and even now, um, as a coach, eighty percent of my clients are female. Oh, okay, and, wow. Yeah, and, and and that was surprising to me as as I started to notice that most of the people that signed up were female, for some reason, and maybe it's just because of the demographic that I work with. It's usually people that are you know, like you said, eighteen to thirty five, I guess. Um, I, I find that men are less likely to seek out advice from people. Um, I feel like if I were a high level uh, competitor, maybe a, a world record holder or something like that, I probably would get more men signing up because of that sort of proof is in the pudding, right? They see that yeah. I'm lifting a ton of weight and they want to be like me as opposed to females tend to not care as much about that kind of stuff they're coming to me because they want the expertise, they want the guidance. So I think that you, it kind of, kind of rings true in both ways with the research that you're saying and in the practical side of things. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, so I know that um, we were having a conversation about as far as teaching goes, like you, you, you've transitioned a lot of your teachings towards that physique enhancement and towards you know, nutrition uh, related stuff, as opposed to when I was, was there, you were, you were teaching a little bit more of strength and conditioning and things like that, maybe out of necessity. Um, how has that been for you? That's been, it's been good. I, I love the transition. So yeah, when you were here, I was more of the physiology 
um, lecturer. I taught cardiovascular aspects of exercise physiology, neuromuscular aspects of exercise physiology, mm-hmm. strength and conditioning. Since our program has grown, our master's program is about twice the size of what it was when you were here. So we were able to wow. grow it a lot. And give me one second. I need to plug in my computer. So give me one second. Sure. Yeah, so I'll just talk a little bit here while, while uh, he does that. You know, when I was there uh, at USF, um, you know, Dr. Campbell was probably the favorite as far as all of the professors were concerned. And no, no disrespect to the rest of the professors that were there, but it's just I think, uh, I think the classes that, that you taught were, were maybe a little bit more enjoyable by nature just because most of us were – interested in strength and conditioning and yeah. things like that. So those were the classes we were there for as opposed to the necessities like research methods and things like that. So I'm pretty interested to hear about the new classes. So, so go ahead. Yes, yeah, so we were able to hire Dr. Sam Buckner from Ole Miss. He was, yeah. he's a, um, he was mentored by Dr. Jeremy Lenneke. Yeah. So he's now teaching all of our physiology based classes and our strength and conditioning classes. And he's, he's a very good scientist. He's very good with the students. I mean, he's created an entire research line here uh, w- uh, related to uh, blood flow restriction. Oh, yeah. And muscle size versus muscle strength and just pretty much anything to do with hypertrophy. Awesome. So anybody who's interested in what I'm interested in is naturally going to be drawn to what he does. Sure. And he does this at a high level. He uses uh, B-mode ultrasound to look at the changes in muscle from resistance training. And where I've shifted is now I'm shifted into teaching more nutrition-based classes. So one of the classes uh, that we developed is called the Science of Physique Enhancement. Sure. And essentially, I mean, you could call it a bodybuilding class. Um, We look at overfeeding. We look at starvation. We look at body composition methods, energy balance, meal frequency, um, tracking, uh, flexible dieting, like all of the topics that are relevant for somebody trying to improve their physique. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, it's, it's the research that I do. So I'm, you know, I'm able to talk about our, the research that we're doing in my lab in that class. And, you know, a third of the class is on my research team. So we're able just to extend kind of the lab setting to the classroom setting. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other class that's new compared to when you were here is a, a uh, summer online class called Controversies in Exercise and Nutrition Science. Okay. So what I do there is it's all online, and essentially we have like controversial topics, and I make the students give me their opinions on these prior to me giving them any scientific readings. So what's their current opinion? Why do you have that opinion? Then I give them six or eight articles that are split down the middle, half saying this works or half saying that it doesn't work. And now they have to update their opinion based on those ratings. And some of those topics are protein timing, a high fructose corn syrup and weight gain, um, the hormone hypothesis theory for skeletal muscle hypertrophy, uh, repetition ranges for inducing muscle mass. So those are some of the topics that we're looking at. That's really cool. That's really cool because yeah. I feel that, especially coming into the program out of undergrad, you know, um, most people probably have delved a little bit into reading research. Obviously, if they're coming to the master's program, they've probably dabbled a little bit in reading abstracts and things like that. But I still think that as an undergrad, you're so um, you're so subject to having these predisposed biases because of maybe the industry influence or all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, supplement companies trying to sell you different things and make it seem like you need this or you need this repetition yeah. range and all that. So that's really awesome that uh, I think, I think that's awesome that you, you have them give you their opinion first and then you give them research and have them reformulate their opinion or maybe not depending or, on. Or it just reinforces their opinion. Re- and that's yeah, reformulate or reinforce. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's part of it. If you haven't changed your opinion at all, Tell me what. Tell me how this literature has now reinforced your prior opinion. So it's, it works anyway. Yeah, because I, I think that's the important thing too. Is is you're not as long as you can back up your claims with with good research, with good science. 
you know, you, you have a case to make, right? As long as you're coming at it with, with good science, good research that's, that's backing up what you're saying, then, then that's fine. It's when people come at it with no, no research or no, no, nothing to back them up. That's when there's a problem, I think. And, and unfortunately, it's, it seems like the more science that comes out, there's still just as many people coming out with these crazy claims with no research behind it. Have, have that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And yeah. I like to kind of look at my research agenda as what are people doing in the real world, like flexible dieting, sure. like diet breaks, um, flexible daily undulating periodization. <laughs> um, what are they doing in the real world? Yeah. And my lab is kind of like a, a test tube for, okay, this is what people are doing. Is, does, it, does it work? Like if we put it in a laboratory setting. So I, I'm essentially testing popular things that are in the fitness communities now. And, and I think that that's, that's one thing I was going to bring up is the kind of research you do is I feel so practical for, for people who are actually trying to improve body comp or trying to improve performance or what have you, because, you know, you're, you're not, you're not designing these crazy in-depth, you know, like we're not taking muscle biopsies and all that kind of stuff. You're, you're testing things that are, that are just, like you said, it's things that people are doing outside of, of the research lab. They're doing it in the gym. They're doing it at home in the kitchen or whatever the case may be. And they're having some success. Maybe other people aren't having the same success. So what, is, what does the research say when we actually test the hypothesis? And I think that that's super important. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, you mentioned a few topics earlier that, that are in your um, the class, like, you know, meal timing, uh, maybe, maybe get into like intermittent fasting and things like that. Obviously, these are like super popular topics these days, a lot of especially like intermittent fasting, a lot of big names like like Mark Bell, um, things like that I have been really big proponents of intermittent fasting. Um, what what research have you seen or are you familiar with that maybe is, is gives a positive light to intermittent fasting and maybe on the opposite side of things gives a negative light to intermittent fasting? So one thing that frustrates me within the literature and even I guess in life is there's no set definition for intermittent fasting and that that bothers me to me fasting is no food like it's it's 24 hours or whatever 36 sure. hours of no food I think a better definition the way it's commonly implemented is time restricted feeding Sure. Sachin so, Panda is like a big researcher in that side, in that side of things. With, with yes. The yeah. So that's one frustrating thing. I'm hesitant to give my opinion on intermittent fasting. Okay. With first defining what that is. That's a good, that's a good um, thing. Yeah. I think a lot of people are confused there. And I wrote an article about this, about how fasting in the traditional sense and intermittent fasting aren't necessarily the same thing. So yeah, if you could explain that. That'd be great. Well, that's, again, this is just my opinion because I don't think sure. there's a scientific consensus on the terms. Sure. For me, when I hear the word fasting or intermittent fasting, I look at that as not eating on Thursday, okay. not eating on Monday, mm -hmm. other than water. So no caloric intake. If I hear the term time-restricted feeding, I'm interpreting that as... I can, I'm eating, but I'm only eating in a five hour window or eight hour window, let's say from like noon to eight. Mm -hmm. So my beliefs, and I, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to give my opinion rather than support this with science. And I, I believe the science would support this. I don't believe that intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding, that those techniques offer anything special to induce fat loss above and beyond what total caloric intake would provide us. Sure. So there's sure. nothing magical about intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. You're not tricking the body into anything. Sure. Where I think they have a lot of value is in the sense that if it fits somebody's lifestyle, I'll give my own example here. I practice time-restricted feeding, I suppose. I don't really look at it like that. I, I don't eat breakfast. Call that what you want. 
I've learned over the years I'm not hungry when I wake up. But I used to always force myself to eat breakfast. And, you know, that might have been 600 calories. And why did I do that? Well, I always ate breakfast because I thought all of the research told me you have to eat breakfast. Everybody that maintains their weight loss eats breakfast. Mm -hmm. So then I actually looked into all of the research that I could find about the importance of eating breakfast. And I couldn't find any studies. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find one on the importance of breakfast for, for fat loss. Mm -hmm. What I did find was that in the National Weight Loss Registry, people that were formerly obese that lost weight and were able to maintain that weight loss, an overwhelming consistent feature of their success was that they ate breakfast. That was the one data point that I could find. Sure. I believe that your total caloric intake is going to determine your ability to gain or lose weight. And let's just say the goal here is fat loss. So if I'm not hungry in the morning, I would much rather bank those calories for when I'm hungry at one o'clock. So again, does that make me a proponent of time restricted feeding? Maybe I, I, I just call it, I'm going, I'm going to match my food intake with my natural drive, with my natural hunger drive in a given 24 hour period. What do we call, what would you call that? I don't know what you call that. No, it's just being smart, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, so, well, yeah, with that, I think, do you, do you think that some people, so do you think it's beneficial at all for some people to explore some time restricted feeding or, or maybe see if they feel okay without breakfast or something? Cause some people just do it out of habit, right? Like they, they wake up in the morning Maybe they're not even that hungry, but they eat. Um, they they eat because it's just it's just a habit. It's just something they've done all their yeah. life, or whatever whatever the case may be. Um, you're saying that essentially, as long as calories are held at a certain level, that's ultimately going to drive fat loss. And uh, you know, as long as you're hypocaloric, um, the, the intermittent fasting isn't going to provide any extra fat loss. It's not going to provide any extra magical boost to your metabolism or anything like that. It's simply the fact that you're eating fewer calories within that window. Do you think that for some people, maybe that um, struggle with, with hunger all day, that there's something going on there where, where they shorten that time window to say six, eight hours that they will get a relief of hunger outside of that window? Or, or, or do you think that it's not the case? No, I think, I think that could be the case for some people. And if, it, if that is the case, then absolutely. And again, that's my case. Yeah. Well, you should, you should embrace that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've done in my classes, and I don't have clients right now, but like you do, but I have as an assignment in my science of physique um, science of physique enhancement class, I have all of the students attempt a 36 hour fast or 32 hour fast. And the, the reason for that is, and let me just define it. Um, let's just say, let's today, today's Wednesday. So if they were going to follow this assignment, they could eat all the way up until tonight before they go to bed. And I don't want them to eat again until they wake up Friday morning. Sure. So I want an entire day from when they wake up to when they go to bed of no food intake. The only thing they can take is water. Right. The reason I think when, Wednesday night, they, they have their dinner, they go all day Thursday, they don't eat. Friday morning, they can have their breakfast. Yes. Breakfast. And they can even have a snack before bed to, on Wednesday night. It doesn't have to be dinner. Okay. The reason I think that is so valuable is, is two things, and I don't have science to support this. this is, these are just my thoughts. One, you're, do you wake up starving? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, then you know, I probably need to eat breakfast. Mm -hmm. If you're not hungry until 11, 12, or 1, listen to that. Listen to your hunger cues because don't force yourself breakfast. Again, the goal here is if, 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 if your goal is to lose weight, let's be in tune with our hunger drives. And you said it earlier. Some people are going to do things just out of habit. So by fasting throughout the entire day, we're going to start to tune into when we are hungry. For me, I know it's about one o'clock and six or seven o'clock. Uh, now I eat more than twice, but typically I have two big meals and then uh, like protein feedings at other parts of the day. The other thing that I think is highly valuable is if you can go an entire day without eating, 
you know in your head for the rest of your life, you can beat hunger for a day. Yep. So when you're dieting, I think it's a lot easier from a mental toughness standpoint for you to be able to say, I can go, I, I went on an entire day without eating before. I've done this. I can, I can beat this. Yeah. Um, I've done that once. I did it like five years ago. I went an entire, and, for, and that was a huge, I, I'm talking about it today. That was a huge mental win for me as a, just as a human being. I love, I'm telling you, Andres, I love food. Mm, I can, off. yeah, yes. Um, and, and your story is amazing. I mean, you've, you've beat obesity, which is, <laughs> I mean, you are a fraction of the population that, 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 that can, can make that claim. Sure. So I'm just saying when I'm hungry now, one o'clock and, and I have meetings or something, and I'm hungry in the back of my mind, this is, I've, I've been here. I've already done this. I, I, I can handle this. I think now, that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now to be fair, and because I'm always scared of getting sued, I tell my students, <laughs> you just have to try this. If you can't do it, I don't want you passing out while you're driving to work or to school. So I'm, I tell them literally in the syllabus, you don't have to, you don't have to complete this to get credit. You just have to tell me why you quit. If you can't get past nine o'clock, that's fine. Why couldn't you get past nine o'clock? What was your, what was going through your head? Um, I make them have Gatorade or some type of sugar with them. Like don't get lightheaded again. I don't, I don't want anybody to get injured here. So I don't force them to do it. And I'd say about a quarter of my students, and these are graduate students, are able to actually do the entire day of fasting. Interesting. Yeah, so I, it, it's something that I've also played around with. Uh, I think a year ago, I went four days without eating. I did a four-day fast. Oh. Uh, I just wanted did you, to did see. You know that? Huh? Did you take notes? I wish I did. Uh, I can remember vividly that the first day was the hardest. The second day wasn't so bad. And then days three and four were actually pretty easy. Wow. Uh, I, want, I, wish I, I wish I had like a ketone meter to see if I had entered ketosis or anything like that, but I didn't. I just kind of did it out of pure, just, I don't know. I just wanted to see if I could kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and every now and then I'll do a full day of fasting and especially, I like to do it, especially after a few days where I, maybe I've been on vacation and I've let myself kind of indulge for a few days because for me personally, having been obese in the past, there is still that tendency inside of me to want to just kind of lose control and just keep eating and eating and eating. And I have to, I have to be diligent about keeping that part of me at bay and so one one thing that i found that has helped is if i have a few days like i said where i'm on vacation where i do something where i'm just kind of eating at will whatever i want if i give myself a day after that where i fast all day it sort of resets me back to being disciplined about how i eat again and that's something that i've just seen personally and i think that you you made a good point earlier about how you have to kind of figure out what works personally for you um, and, and this is something I see with my clients because I, I get a lot of questions if they should try this, that, and the other. And I've tried having some people do intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, um, mostly because I just wanted to see if it helped them with some of the issues that they were having with around food. And for some, it worked, and for some, it didn't. But it's such an individual tool, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, going on that point now with intermittent fasting, I know that with, within the research, it seems to be clear, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, when it comes to protein timing, say, there are, there's some research out there to suggest that like after a protein feeding, there's a sort of a refractory period of a few hours where you can't really spike muscle protein synthesis maximally again within that time window. And so if you do the math and kind of play it out throughout the day, it kind of seems that maybe three to five feedings of protein spaced evenly throughout the day is kind of ideal. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's my opinion. I'm, I'm aware, that's my opinion based on the science. Sure. I, I'm aware of approximately six studies around, let's say, protein timing around the workout. Okay. Three of those studies showed no effect on muscle protein synthesis um, or just chronically uh, muscle mass gain 
okay. with protein taken immediately before, immediately after. The other three studies that I'm aware of, um, one of the, I'm just going to name some authors here. S. Mark was the positive study. Uh, Crib and Hayes was a positive study. Now, in that study, it wasn't just protein. There was also creatine and glucose. But th those two studies plus a third showed a significant increase in muscle mass or an acute muscle protein synthesis response when protein was taken immediately before or after the resistance training session. Okay. So I look at that as three studies showed that there's no impact. Three studies show it was positive. It never hurt. You're going to have to take, you're going to need protein anyway. If you're trying to optimize for your physique, you need protein. So why wouldn't you take it after a workout or before? Sure. Sure. So that's how I interpret that data. Okay. Um, but again, the, the, the literature is, again, 50% of the science would say, no, no difference. Yeah. So applying that with, say, somebody who has some sort of time-restricted eating, let's say they have an eight-hour window that they, they eat in, um, you know, is that, are they hurting themselves at all with respect to having those protein feedings being evenly spaced? Let's say they eat at noon, they eat again at four, and they eat again at eight o'clock. Um, now that's four hours in between, and then they're going, you know, 16 hours without. You know, is, is that a good strategy for somebody? Uh, what about somebody who maybe can only eat twice during that time? So let's say they eat around noon and they eat again around, you know, seven, eight o'clock, and they're getting really big boluses of protein at each feeding, you know, what, 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 what can you speak to on that kind of thing with, with people? Because I know a lot of people are concerned with is fasting going to, or, or time restricted eating going to affect my ability to gain muscle and strength and things like that. Yeah. I don't think there, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding and resistance exercise and protein intake. But just giving it my informed opinion based on the studies around these areas and converging to form my opinion, I think what you said is exactly how I would do it myself. If I was only going to eat from 12 to 8, I would try to do a 12, 4, and 8. Okay. Um, or one of those would be post-workout. So every time my finishing my workout would be one of the times that I'm getting protein. If I was going to eat twice, I would do it at the beginning and end of, of my window of feeding. I, I believe that makes sense. Okay. And, um, you know, because I know some people take it to an extreme, you know, like the, I, I know some people out there who have like a 20 hour win or a four hour window of eating, 20 hours of fasting. You know, within that, obviously, it seems like that four hours is just going to be kind of grazing almost like maybe they'll have a big meal and then they kind of like graze on other foods throughout the day. I know that you so you mentioned there's no research on that, but how would you feel, maybe if you were to put maybe a percentage on it or something like that, if somebody were to eat one big bolus of protein and maybe just a little bit more within a couple hours after that, how, what, what kind of effect are they having on their muscle building ability, if, if any? So I am aware of one, one study where they actually did compare Two okay. large boluses, you're probably familiar with it. I think it was, I want to say Elliot, mm -hmm. um, but they gave, um, it was 40 grams was the largest amount immediately after exercise, resistance exercise, and then again, I think it was six hours later. Then another group, they gave them 20 grams every two hours, and then the third group was 10 grams every hour. Sure. And just looking at the acute muscle protein synthesis response, the level of protein that gave the best response was the moderate approach, the 20 grams every two hours. Okay. Now, there are a lot of limitations with that study. It was like four sets of leg extension, so it wasn't a big workout. Um, I think the protein was whey protein. So if you just took that study and – appreciate it for what it is without looking at all of the, the you know the, the the holes in the design you would say you're better off taking a moderate amount of protein and spreading it more throughout the day mm -hmm. so one thing that i find interesting when it comes to all this stuff is is you have two different camps i guess you have the people who are very um regimented in how they eat they're very um they they 
they take all the research into account. They do everything correctly as far as spacing their protein apart, taking protein after the workout, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and then you have the people who, for lack of a better word, I guess, are just, they don't, well, they just don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. They, they just go to the gym, they eat whenever they, they feel like it. And sometimes people in that camp, you, you notice that they, they gain a lot of muscle. There, there's some people out there who never paid any attention to their diet or any attention to how they work out. They just work out and they eat and they, you know, they're just physical specimens as opposed to maybe somebody on this side, like I'll just use myself as an example. You know, if I could do everything perfectly. I know all the science. I know how to eat. I know all that kind of stuff. I don't necessarily feel like it makes me gain any muscle any faster than anybody else. How can you explain that? Do you think it's just genetics? Do you think that the guy who just doesn't pay attention to his diet and doesn't pay attention to the way he trains but still gets jacked is just genetically gifted? Do you think that there's something to be said about maybe not worrying about it so much when it comes to your diet and your training? Yeah. So I'll share my personal feelings before I give my, my advice or my challenge. Mm -hmm. My personal feeling is it's much better to be the person who's not obsessive about tracking their macros. They're living their life. They're getting gains. If that's somebody, I would never want to convince them to do anything else. Like, why would I do that? You're, you're one, you have more time. You're not stressed about things. So that that's ideal. I would, I would then say to challenge, if that person were, if that same person were to be more cognizant of all of their tracking, the timing, the workouts, the reps, the sets, could they get better results? My, my impression would be they probably would, and it wouldn't happen the other way, where you have somebody who's tracking everything taking all of the scientific findings reports very seriously. And then you tell them, Hey, chill out a little bit. I, what, what I believe would happen would be that they would not get the gains that they are, that they are experiencing gotcha. in terms of how two people are going to respond. I believe there's a huge genetic component to that. And it's, it's, it's just, it's unfortunate and a lot of people stress about that. You know, I, I get a lot of inquiries about, hey, I'm doing this and I, I'm just not, you know, and I'll ask questions and they're doing everything right. And I'm very fortunate that I'm not a professional coach like you. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't, I'd say, well, it seems like you're just going to have to be happy being mediocre in your <laughs> physique goals. Yeah. I don't know if you can say that as a coach. I'm a scientist. So I'm not dependent on their income. I can be a little more harsh. Um, th that's what I think. Uh, you're, you, you, some people are going to respond. Some people are not, even if you're doing everything right. And it's unfortunate. Yeah, I had this conversation with uh, one of your past students and a friend of mine, Danny Bove, who um, he works for the Phoenix Suns now. And I was having a conversation with him about some of the, you know, the athletes that he works with and how, you know, these guys are just phenomenally gifted. Their, their genetics are, you know, the top 0.1% of the population. And, and one thing that I notice is, is a lot of times basketball players, or maybe even athletes in general, maybe not, maybe not football players, but outside of that sport, they don't necessarily have a passion for strength and conditioning, lifting weights, doing all that kind of stuff. They just want to play their sport. And so I was asking him, at least with respect to basketball players, does, does he think that if basketball players were to start, like let's say we took LeBron James or Kevin Durant and we put them on the best plan, the best strength and conditioning plan and everything ever since they were eight years old or, or something like that, all the way up to now, do does he think or, or that they would be any better of a basketball player because of it? And, and it's kind of hard to answer, obviously, but it almost seems like I don't know if they would have been. You know what I mean? Their their genetic the genetic component there is so strong, and I think it's not the same as as it doesn't apply the same to maybe everyday people who are just trying to look better or maybe compete in bodybuilding or something like that. But I think that you're right in that genetics seems to play just a huge role and it's not fair. Unfortunately, some people are just predisposed to looking great, 
having lower body fat, having higher muscle mass than others. And, uh, you know, like for myself, I have to, I have to train really hard and really be careful about my diet if I want to maintain a certain physique, whereas a lot of my friends don't necessarily have to be that way. They can, they just look at weights, they get bigger, <laughs> um, you know, they just, uh, they don't have to care about their diet. They don't, they don't track macros and things like that. But it, I think it is, I think it is tough for coaches out there to have to deal with the, the clients who just don't have it genetically. They're not gifted. Yeah. Um, and that's not to take away from the people who have great physiques. Oh no, not at all. And cause a lot of them work hard to get that. And then we do know that there are outliers, like you said, but just because somebody looks great, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they didn't have to work to get it. That right. can be like, true sometimes. I think a good example, like, like Mike Tyson was just a genetic freak, right? I, I don't think he cared much about his diet most of the time. I think maybe during training camp he did. I don't think he did anything special with periodization with his training or anything like that. He just was jacked, you know, yeah. and, and – that just that's just him. Maybe he would have been more jacked. Maybe he'd have been bigger, faster, and stronger if he had been, you know, really, really uh, paying attention to his training and his diet, like you said earlier. But some people are just at that level, and it's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, I'll I'll just share a quick story on this because it just happened. Sure. Um, I just we just did some body comp testing on a a, a pro bikini competitor. She's actually going to be in the Olympia this year. Okay. And she had done some prior uh, macro tracking for us in, in, in one of our projects. And we sent her the macros. And what she sent back was perfectly to the gram of what she was asked to do. And James Longstrom, he's, he's um, a former master student of mine. He's directing these studies. He's, he questioned this, this particular um, high level physique athlete. He goes, Hey, just wanted to make sure that you understand, you know, what, you know, you don't just have to copy and paste what we're sending you. Like, give us what you're actually doing. Yeah. She goes, I, I, I hit, I hit my macros to the gram. Wow. And that's an Olympia. I mean, she'll be on the Olympia stage this year. So there's an example of, okay, that maybe that's what it takes. Um, yeah. I know I don't hit my macros to the gram. Um, so there's a challenge to people who think they're doing well and trying hard. Are you? Sure. Sure. I think, so. yeah, I, I see that a lot with my clients and some people are a little more, you know, there's a little bit, a lot more variability. Now the average through the week is usually about where they need to be, but they have variability from day to day. And then I have some people who are, you know, within two or three grams a day. Maybe I don't think I've had one who was exactly, you know, to the T every single day. That's, but, you know, yeah, that's, and I think that's maybe a personality thing also. Some people are very type A and they need to have everything be perfect as opposed to some people are, are more comfortable just saying, oh, I was 10 grams off today. I'll just be 10 grams on the other way tomorrow or something. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, I, I, here's a good question that I'm that I that I'm very interested to have your opinion on is, do you think sometimes with respect to science, and now, now the way you set up your training studies or your, your research studies, I should say, um, has a very, it's, a, it, it's very uh, practical. You can take those results and, and for the most part, they carry over into the real world. Sometimes you get training studies or, or nutrition studies that almost seem like they're so far into the, con they're so controlled and they're so, you know, uh, they're so far the other way that it's like, oh, can we even use this for practical reasons? Uh, and the reason I bring this up, I guess, is sometimes I find that there are things that in practical sense that maybe the research say don't work for certain people or for, for in general that do work for certain people. And then the other way that there are things that the research says should work that don't necessarily work once you actually get them into the practical you know, side of things. Um, do you think that, or what are some examples maybe that you've seen of people or of research that, that maybe seemed really good on paper but didn't really carry over or vice versa? 
didn't seem very good on paper, but but did carry over well. Well, with within the context of your question, one thing I would state is most research is only giving presenting their data as group averages. Sure. So if if an, if somebody has an average weight loss of five pounds, like one group, that means that some people lost fifteen pounds. Some people lost no weight. You're only getting the averages. One of the changes in the scientific literature now is more and more scientists are starting to put individual data points as part of their graphs. So that's something I started to do in, in all of my studies now. And you'll see we're um, possibly tomorrow, I'm, I'm this close to submitting our flexible dieting study that we did back when Lauren Conlon was here. That was a study that she, she coordinated and directed. And one of the figures is the, the overall fat loss was around seven pounds over a 10 week period of, of dieting. And I literally, I mean, I spent like three hours one day plotting all of the individual fat loss data points. It is amazing. There were people that lost, I don't know, I'm just going off the, off the top of my head, 12 pounds of fat and people who lost half a pound wow. to get this average of eight. And presumably, they were all in a similar caloric reduction of about 20% in that range. So that really highlights just the variability from person to person. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but I know within the context of your question, that's, I think, a very important consideration when reading research. You're looking at group averages, not individual responses, and you can't forget that. So what I'm hearing from you basically is that when you're reading research, say, and you're trying to make an informed decision about yourself or about a client of yours or something like that, you have to have that little reservation that there are some people that this did not work for, even though the, even though the research says that on average it should work, um, some people don't respond well to it. And some people hyper respond to things like that. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Yeah. And I would go as far as to say, and this, this, this may be, oh, what's the word? Not, not hypocrisy. Um, what's the word when you're saying something that's so countercultural to your profession? What, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. Sort of, uh, I know what you're saying. I'm coming. I'm not coming up with the word either. So I'll I'll say the 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 idea. If the science says one should do this, and and in my own life, it's it's not okay. So if if all of the science told me eat breakfast, eat breakfast, sure, and I eat breakfast, and it's very hard for me to be in a caloric deficit at the end of the day. I'm starving at night, but all the literature says eat breakfast. I would say, as a scientist, I publish articles in journals. I'm, I'm, you know, president, former president of a scientific organization. I don't care what the science says. I'm going to do what works for me. Now, I'm careful to say that because some people are going to do things that are so anti-scientific or or antithetical to what we know. You have to be careful. So yeah. that's within the broader context of. The science says we have to have a caloric deficit to lose weight. I'm not going to worry about the minutiae throughout the hours of the day of how I'm going to get there at the end of the day, regardless of what the science says. I'm, I'm going to prioritize the science that says I need to have a caloric deficit, and I'm going to, do, I'm going to follow that. So another way of saying it is I try to keep things simple. I try not to get lost in the minutia. A lot of people want to go to the minutia. And I think that's, that causes a lot of undue stress and anxiety for people. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's where, at least in my profession, there's, there's an art to coaching and there's a science to coaching, right? Obviously, I rely as much as I can on the science of you know, what the literature says with respect to you know, anything that comes up with my clients. But then sometimes there's an art to it as well, right? There's... Um, you have to you have to know when to pick and choose those things for each person based on who they are and how they respond to things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, I think that there's a bunch of different stuff that I wish we could get get into. I know you you have some time constraints here, 
But, hey, we can uh, we can do another one in a few weeks. Yeah, that, I'd be all for that. Um, so I, I probably have to cut cut, cut it off there just because I, I don't want you to I don't want to make you late for any of your other stuff. I know it has a cascading effect. Um, I definitely would like to do another one of these in the future because I think we just sort of scratched the surface of everything that I could we could get into. Um, yeah. You're a wealth of information, but I really yeah. appreciate you being on the podcast. Yeah, um, and let me interrupt you real quick. Sure. I would love to, next time we talk, ask you, because you were on a path to doing what I do, going into sure. academia. Um, like I said, you, you have a brilliant mind. I'd love to know, or have you, and maybe you've already done this, I don't know, but um, even if you haven't, for my sake, what, what has made, what made you kind of change your mind to, to go into business, which is very, I mean, that's, I, I love entrepreneurs. I, it's, I have a ton of respect for, for what you're doing. It's, um, you know, you have a family to support. That's a, it's, it's stressful. Um, so when we do this again, if, if you can budget like 10 minutes to just go into your mind so I can learn from that. Absolutely. I, I, I definitely will do that. And it's actually something that I, I've been kind of like not talking about it because I was on the path of getting a PhD and all that kind of stuff. And that's been, we'll talk about that next time, but uh, yeah, I definitely would, would, would love to talk about that. Yeah. I think it would be valuable because I think a lot of my students don't necessarily, like, you would, that information would be highly valuable to at least to my, a, a large number of my current and future students. That's good to know. Okay, cool. Well, I'll go ahead and um, let you go now. But again, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And like I said, we'll, we'll schedule another one here real soon. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks. Thank you.